so now we have our next panel. Um, so thank you again, Marcelo, really inspirational. Uh, so we wanna call uh, the group of panelists for the next panel uh, to kick off uh, the panel on women and well-being in the workplace. After the panel, we will have a networking um, coffee break. <laughs> you want this one? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, sure. That one works. Hello, everyone. My name is Agostina Pecci. I'm a managing director at Goldman Sachs. I'm based in, in New York, and I'm so happy to be here, actually meeting some of you in person after doing some Zoom meetings over the past two years. And I'm excited to have this amazing group of folks here in the panel with me. Um, I will we'll start the panel on the topic, and then I'll allow them to introduce themselves briefly as they answer the first question, because they have amazing backgrounds. So we're going to talk about women and well-being in, uh, in the workplace and how these concepts have been evolving, especially over the past two years. It's really been at the center of the business imperative and uh, our different companies have been doing different things. So we want um, each of you to just share how the concepts have been evolving and what your companies have been doing to implement specific policies around mental health and well-being. In no specific order. <laughs> yeah, sure. Can you hear me? There we go. Yeah. Green light is on. Good morning, everybody. And I'll just echo the comments made already. It is just fantastic to be at an in-person event like this. And it's so much easier talking to human beings than a screen. So this is really nice. Um, so my name is Jennifer Bussouge, and I work for Bank of America, and I am our head of global banking operations. And one of the silver linings of COVID is that I can do that job from Miami. There was a time that it could only have been done from New York or our headquarters in Charlotte. So I have the great honor honor of leading a global workforce of over 7,000 people in uh, pretty much every region of the world. So um, it, it's, um, it, you know, it gives me some good perspective on this topic. So, you know, as we think about, um, you know, wellness in the workplace, um, you know, our, what, what we have to offer is our people. Our people are everything. Um, without our people being physically, mentally, and financially well, um, it's really tough for them to do their jobs So um, and bring their best person uh, to sell to work. So we, we've had a longstanding, uh, you know, uh, focus, I would say, on physical well-being. We always have these fit, fit you know, challenges every year, um, the mental well-being as well as financial well-being. But the mental well-being piece is the hardest part. And the reason we find that is because there's such a stigmatism, a, you know, attached to that. And people aren't comfortable talking about it. Um, people are worried and concerned that it could impact their careers, that if they say that they have a weakness or that they have an issue or something's not working, that they might not get that promotion or they might be tagged with, okay, that person, you know, they're not resilient, you know, they don't have what it takes and, and it really could hurt them in their career. So some of the things that we've been doing and really accelerating, I would say, throughout COVID are a couple of programs. One is called Take, Out, uh, Take Time Tuesdays and Courageous Conversations, where we bring in experts from the field on um, mental health, as well as leaders and individual contributors across the bank to have conversations about these topics and really take you know, time to talk about what have people gone through, what are the challenges, and then give them strategies and ideas of how they can deal with it. Um, and I think having those live examples and having professionals talk about it, and then we provide them with resources that they can go to. And these 
these are recorded sessions. So if people can't, it's in the middle of a work day, they can, you know, do it on their own time and, and they can view those. So we've gotten really good feedback and those are really helpful. But um, your mental health doesn't stop at the door when you leave the office. Um, you know, people have really challenging lives and they're, they're tackling a lot of different things. And so some of the other things that we put in place, and this is something we've increased significantly since COVID, is um, counseling sessions. So we actually pay for free counseling sessions um, for our employees. They're completely confidential, you know, with a medical professional. And we've had to we've had to increase the number of those that we offer. We have a life event services team, which is tremendous. I've used them myself. Um, think of any life event that you could possibly go through in your life, um, and they can help you and provide resources and really point you in the direction that you need. And then apps. There's an app for everything. And trust me, there are a lot of wellness apps out there. There are all the fitness ones, but there's a lot of wellness ones. I, I personally like Calm um, <laughs> for those having a hard time sleeping at night because you can't turn your brain off. Yes. Um, and I had my, my son, when he was in college, I'm like, you're getting the Calm app and I'm covering the expense of it for you. <laughs> um, so, um, so I just think all of that holistic support and all of these things and just talking about it to your point earlier, you got to repeat it over and over and over again and start making it something that people are comfortable talking about and being aware of what resources are out there to help them. So a lot going on in that space. Hi, hello. I'm Marcela Pizzi. Um, I work for Atlas Renewable Energy. I'm the head of people and communications that you will know as HR, but in our company, people are people, not resources. Uh, so um, I'm super happy to be here. I echo what Jennifer was saying that it's completely different to have the energy of people face to face. Um, I'm a psychologist and I would say that during pandemic, my role, not only as people and communications officer, but also as a psychologist has been put to the test. We have done um, a, a lot of things to try to understand what's happening and what's going on uh, in terms of what people need uh, from, from their well-being perspective, from a human perspective. And um, during, during pandemic and during COVID, uh, it was kind of a fast forward of many things that we wanted to implement in our company, that we wanted to do, that we thought would be a good idea at some point. And then we were forced <laughs> with pandemic to put those in place. And so we, we took a step back and instead of saying, well, this is what the company is going to put in place for you and what we are offering, we said, let's hear what people need, what people want to say, because there's no one size that fits all. There's many different realities, not only from a gender perspective, but from all the diversity that also Martella was sharing before. And uh, so our strategy was first listening what people wanted to say. And, and uh, then we, we did surveys, we did uh, workshops. And the only thing that we had in the back of our minds that we wanted this to be a really holistic approach, approach on, well, on wellness and well-being. So we took the Aspire philosophy, which is a philosophy that teaches us that people should always be taking care of five crucial dimensions in their lives, the spiritual, the physical, the intellectual, the relational, and the emotional. So then the second step was not just putting in place workshops and, and talking groups about these kind of, of, of things. It was um, then what specific things we can do as a company for people considering this holistic approach that we were thinking. And then it was not only about the, the, the SPIRE model that we translated into a really nice program that is called Renew Your Energy, uh, but it was also that opportunity of looking back and saying, what else can we do? It's not just a program, it's not just wellness, it's not just, it's not just about really uh, suggestions on things. So we took a look also at our policies on how we were doing things, how we were working, how we were communicating. Um, and, and then it came that it's the conversation that Jennifer said, it's, it's not just about workshops, it's people need more than that. So can, how can we help? We also took the opportunity and help with external counseling uh, and different kinds of counseling. We work in different regions as well with different languages. So what happens in Brazil, what happens in the US, what happens in Mexico? How, how important is managing all these sessions in different languages so that people actually can get a benefit from this and, and can use these opportunities? Um, so there's a, I think there's a still a work in progress, but uh, for us, I would say that the, the most important part on this wellness discussion is to consider this from a really um, human point of view and that not one, no, no one, there's no one size that fits everyone and there's no one solution. So we're still working on that, it's a work in progress. 
Good morning, everyone. My name is Svetlana Krop. I work for SAP. Some of you will know our tiny little <laughs> German company of 120,000 employees. We are a software company. We provide business software. And I've been with SAP for, I think, about 17 years. Started out my professional life with SAP in the UK and moved um, right before COVID struck to Miami about three and a half years or so ago. Um, and it's been interesting. First of all, it's absolutely echoing my colleagues here. Absolutely amazing to be here. It's my first, I think, face-to-face -face conference workshop um, panel, I think for about three and a half years. So it's, it's absolutely super to be part of this great team, this great community. Um, I'm looking around, I see lots of women. I would love to, I see some men, this is wonderful. I would love to see more men being allies, attending, listening, engaging. So this is a great start and I'd love to see this uh, change and evolve. So a little bit about my company. Um, I head up customer success. So it's a very, very large organization. And as part of customer success, we always used to say customer first. That was our mantra for many, many, many years. What's happened and uh, COVID, as horrible as it was, has really changed things also for the positive and we have to acknowledge that. We went from saying customer first to people first. And that was a huge, huge change for us. So the focus shifted to how do we make sure that our people are doing well? How do we make sure that people are thriving? And how do we make sure that we as leaders take responsibility and accountability for people, people's well-being? So we acted and you know, German company process oriented. Um, I love my company to bits, but the process is, is very complex and bureaucratic. What was incredible is how quickly we pivoted towards people first model and how quickly we started to focus on well-being of our employees. One of the things we implemented almost straight away was a mental health day that we have every year that is devoted to ensuring our employees well-being. So it's, it's led by, it's, it's basically an entire day and it follows the sun. So it's a global event and we bring in specialists in mental health, physical health, um, focusing on the person, focusing on how do we support that person. Um, people can take a day off and do absolutely nothing or people can attend these sessions. Their response has been incredible. There's so much investment into this and there's so much positive outcomes that come out of it. We also have started to invest more and more into employee assistance programs, which is an opportunity for us to support our employees going through any kind of emotional, physical, um, whatever change that they're going through in their life. And there's a lot of investment. But the reality is, you know, and I didn't know this, apparently we've always had that. Um, it just was not well advertised. And one thing that happened during the pandemic is that there was a lot of focus on bringing these programs to people. We as leaders have this incredible responsibility to everyone to ensure that everyone is looking after, you know, is looked after, is taken care of. And I think that's exactly what happened during this difficult time. We all went on Zoom. We all had additional responsibility. We're all looking after our families. Our children, our, you know, our elderly parents, our pets, everything else that happened. So giving that attention to employee, putting the employee at the center of everything that we do became really the focus of, of, you know, of what the change was happening. And I agree, you know, this is just the beginning. We still have so much to do. The catalyst was there for change. It's up to us as leaders to continue having that discussion, to continue supporting our workforce, to be there for our employees and having these types of forums. And again, I'd love to see more men attending and being allies would be great. So I look forward to engaging. I look forward to learning from everyone and I look forward to continuing that dialogue. Thank you. Well, good morning, everybody. My, no my name is uh, Alvaro Cardenas. I'm the head of uh, Diageo in Latin America. Um, so thanks for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here to not just share perspective, also to learn a lot, because I think this is an endless journey, you know, for all of us. Um, Diageo, maybe some of you, you don't know what is Diageo, but I hope that some of you have tried some of our brands. Um, so we are the, we are the, especially during the pandemic, we are the largest uh, spirits company, premium spirits company in the world. We operate in 180 countries. We have a portfolio of 240 brands. Um, which are our giants, you know, there is a combination be between global giants and local jewels. So brands like Johnny Walker, the, you know, that is 203 years old, Guinness, 250 years old, Gordon, 260. So brands that has seen world, world wars, pandemics, and still are here, um, vibrant and, you know, um, 
they can consumers to fall in love with. Um, and, and local jewels like Don Julio, yeah, the here um, across Latin America that now is becoming a world success uh, actually. So that's, uh, that's our business. Uh, the purpose of the Agio is celebrating life every day and everywhere. Um, and I think in order to celebrate life, you need to celebrate diversity and inclusion. And that's why this is uh, so important for us, you know, as the organization. Um, and just reflecting something that you said, um, Marcelo, which is that's why this is an endless journey. You never take it, you, you cannot get complacent in this. Um, and yesterday I was, I was having a conversation uh, with a line manager about talent. And I always, I'm always surprised about how main leaders, you know, reflect or describe female powerful leaders. And they were the words that they use, you know, no, she's ambitious and she's aggressive. So she, and even in how they frame female leaders, sometimes if they use the same to describe a, you know, a male leader, they will use words like he's bold, you know, strategic, et cetera. So I think uh, that uh, continue rewiring around uh, how we create more diversity and value, you know, um, uh, every single leader, especially our, our women leaders, is, is, a, is an, an endless journey for all of us. Um, now, answering the question about well-being, and I'm not going to repeat about everything. We have done similar things across the Agio. Our priority number one in the organization was taking care of the holistic aspect of our people. The mental health, which is the wellness and well-being. Um, similar programs that, uh, that um, you know, what my colleagues here described. One of the things that was very important for us is to feel, to make this feel genuine and authentic. Because now well-being is not anymore an alternative, it's a must. If you want to attract people, this is becoming one of the number one things that people are asking for in the new workforce, yeah? Um, and that's why, and the way that we're approaching this beyond the programs is around causing different, difficult conversations, conversations that before were taboo, you know, or myths like menopause. So during the pandemic, we launched our menopause guidelines just to increase awareness. So by 2025, we are going to have, have more than 1 billion women going through menopause. And in our organization, it's a topic, but nobody talks about it. So we, hope we launched those guidelines, not only to provide support, also to create the conversation. Um, we launched a guidance about family abuse and domestic abuse not only to provide legal support, also to create the psychological safety for people to raise the topic and open the conversation. And we are training our line managers because one of the most difficult aspects of mental health is not that much about the program, it's the ability to have the conversation in the right way. Refreshing, no, to hear what different size companies and you know, places in different parts of the world have been doing to advance the, the matter. Um, Alvaro started talking about some initiatives that are specific for women. And I was wondering, when you talk about these policies, how you have, what, what are the key things to consider when designing well-being policies for women? I'm happy to jump in. I, I found that was so refreshing and I wanted to bring up the, the topic of menopause as well. Um, we have a number of networks. We have a women's network um, within the bank as well. And this is an emerging topic. And I think, you know, uh, you know, people are, are working longer and given where the stock market is today, I think a lot of people are going to be working longer than they had planned to work. Um, and to, to your point, it's such a taboo topic. Um, and I, but I cannot tell you how many women have come up to me and talked to me about it and it impacts their mental well-being. I, so many women come like, I feel like I'm going crazy. I, I, I'm snapping over things. I have no patience. I, you know, and then worrying about the impact on, on their job and wanting how to deal with it and wanting to talk to other women. How do you deal? How have you overcome it? And so, um, so I think bringing that out. So I'll have to follow up with you afterwards because I'd love to know more about your programs, but it's definitely a topic that we're talking more about and having women. I was on a panel recently talking about my own personal experience with a hormone replacement therapy, just throwing that out there. Um, um, but but it's, it's a really important topic. But also I think what you talked about is the generational piece. So how do we be more responsive is, you know, to the point that was made earlier, not one size fits all. So the listening that we do a lot of surveys and get feedback on what are the topics and really having these different sessions and 
and, and services that are geared to that. And we saw it as well. In fact, Deloitte did a, a big study on, you know, on millennials and Gen Xers. And that's what they said. You know, obviously, you know, financial compensation is important to everybody, but, you know, it's right up there. It's equal to if they look at the baby boomer generation where it was really just all about financial stability, not so much for the millennials and Gen Xers. When they're looking at an employer and what's important to them, all of the rest of this stuff is equally important. And if you don't provide it as a company, they'll go elsewhere. Um, so I think, um, you know, the, those are some important aspects. I don't know if we have enough time to discuss about this. <laughs> but uh, yeah, two minutes. I will try to do my best. <laughs> so again, the thing is, super complex subject and matter because there's a lot of factors that of course came in, come in like like you said the age factor that the, the uh, even nationality gender sexual orientation there's a lot of things in thinking about women so you you cannot say oh yeah maternity no that's not just it and even if you discuss about maternity that's for example our case so we, when we first began we said okay so what are we going to do for women okay <laughs> maternity but then the discussion about maternity, it's not about women. It's, it's about how we, we, we uh, create the sense of co-responsibility, how we bring men on board to discuss th those kind of things so that women can actually access the workforce or, the, or, or, uh, or a job where they can not only be a mom, but also be a working mom. So then you have the other discussion. So opening, opening uh, doors for, for women, and like you said, Marcelo, taking a look at our recruiting processes. What are we doing wrong? It's not just about asking for uh, the goodwill of our headhunters and find more women. It's like, if you don't bring me women, I'm not working with you, period. <laughs> and that's it. And then what you do afterwards with what we being with uh, of women when working at the company, what do you do with your compensation and benefits? What do you do with the work environment, with the language, with the jokes, with, with the activities that you do as a company? Are they really inclusive and thinking of women well-being, for example, or not? And then what about women development? So I'm really proud that during the pandemic, one of the things that we launched besides taking a look at, at everything that I just have mentioned is, for example, taking a look at our uh, health insurance. And we said, what's happening? with fertility people are postponing their their uh, maternity for example because they feel that they need to grow and develop at work first but it's happening with menopause as well so not only counseling about those kind of things looking at your benefits but at the, on the other side what are we doing as a company and what i'm really proud is that during pandemic we launched a program that it's called she leads that's pretty similar of one of the shows that you were showing to us that it's it was um 56 hours of training to our women in different subjects. It's a, it was a really um, comprehensive uh, workshop that we did with each one of them, touching subjects as glass ceilings, sorority, uh, managing different roles, emotions, how to negotiate, how to speak, how are women perceived for other groups. So that's also taking care of well-being of women in the workspace. So again, there's a lot to do in different in different subjects. So I'm also so happy to be learning from all of you here. Completely agree with you, Marcel. It's a huge topic, but it's not just a topic about women or for women. You know, it's it's you know, <laughs> we represent a significant amount of of you know of the workforce, of course, and there needs to be a conversation. There needs to be a focus. One of the things that happened in SAP um, right before or right around the pandemic is. Um, there were a number of different DNI initiatives that were springing up in the company. We had a global initiative. It was fairly silent. There are a whole bunch of webinars, sessions, but not, not enough maybe participation, not enough buy-in. One thing that happened around the pandemic is there was a lot of focus on how do we bring these initiatives to the women, to the men, to really start building this out. And one of my other responsibilities in the company now is I head up DNI for my organization. And so I'm very, very much involved in the topics around um, hiring women. And we don't have quotas. We don't like quotas. The reality is if you don't have quotas, you don't do it. So if you don't measure it, you don't succeed. And I was actually coming from Europe. I was looking at how do other countries do it? How, you know, how are some of our more successful countries do it? And Scandinavia came up as one of the top countries that really focus on ensuring there's female representation in the workplace and of course on boards. Iceland has a target of 40% women in on their boardrooms. And that has driven a huge change in terms of what happens um, at boardroom representation. In fact, they're one of the most successful countries in the world for having women in leadership. 
So we were looking at statistics, we're looking at numbers, and that's exactly what we're focusing on with hiring in mind. Retention is another big topic. How do you retain female talent? And of course, growing that talent, ensuring that that talent is promoted. So very close to my heart. And as a, you know, as a leader, I was really very much concerned about it. But it's not enough to have that conversation. You know, we pay a lot of lip service to these programs, implementing them, executing on them, and seeing that difference needs to be, first of all, owned at that leadership level. But it also needs to be, you know, every woman needs to buy into this. I'll give you an example about when this is a very personal example. So I lead the DNI group. I'm a head of customer success. I understand these topics. I live them a lot. Two weeks ago, um, my mother ended up in the hospital in the emergency room with COVID complications. She's absolutely fine now, but I had to take time off. And my, my manager was saying, you know, doesn't matter, go and take some time off. I spent three days in the hospital with her, with my laptop in front of me, feeling guilty the entire time that I'm not there for my team, that I'm not there for my manager, that I can't participate in the board meeting where I needed to provide the numbers. And I'm sitting there, I'm thinking, what is wrong with me? You know, I am the one who spends all of my time telling my leadership team, telling my employees, look, take the time for yourself, be there for yourself, nurture yourself, family first, people first. And here I am feeling guilty about the fact that I had to take a few days off for my mother. And that got me thinking fundamentally that the change doesn't just start at that senior level. It has to start with every one of us. And that's one of the things that I'm going to be working on as well is how do you reach out to these women and mentor them and tell them it's okay. You don't have to take on the load of the world on your shoulders, but we collectively have to have policies in place that help. We cannot be doing this on our own. Thank you. Yeah. And I think I'll probably refer to two of the specific things that we are doing on well-being for, for women. But I think uh, there are two things that I would will, will like to highlight. First about maternity. Um, which is a very, it's a broader, you know, topic than simply maternity. But we, four years ago, we in Diageo, we launched our parental leave, pay leave policy, which is six months for dads or moms, you know, uh, irrespective, with the intent of, especially for dads, to go on that and support. And one of the things that I personally do for people, for dads that are on that leave, I call them. And some of the times, what are you doing? How are you enjoying your leave? No, I'm playing golf. And I said, well, this is, that's not the intent of what we are trying to do here, but it's, it's just to reinforce that it's a, it's, it's a muscle, yeah, uh, in the understanding of, uh, of how we are shaping this or the organization in the future. And I think the other topic is around, I think, our responsibility, especially on, on us that has the privilege and, the, and, you know, that we are lucky to work in companies of this size, is that our responsibility transcends our own organization. And I think we have uh, the opportunity to really shape what is happening in the communities that are out there. Um, and when, 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 when the pandemic, you know, hit us, one of the, the sectors that was more impacted was restaurants and bars and, and, you know, across the world. So in the agile, we raised uh, a fund of $100 million to support that sector. And, and one of the conditions, for example, in the case of Brazil, for those bars is that they, in order to access the fund, they need to develop sexual harassment policies. Yeah, which was a big issue, you know, especially in this sector in Brazil. And we connected them with the local authorities, et cetera. And this is how now that sector is operating with a total different framework. So I think that is just an example around the ability that we have also to impact, to have an impact that transcends our own organization. Super inspiring, everything that you're sharing. As, I, as you were talking, I was thinking about Goldman Sachs and my own personal experience, right? I think that paternal leave at Goldman is now paid for six months, but it's optional. And I went through maternity five years ago and it wasn't optional for me. I needed a time off to get better. I didn't even know where my head was at the time. And, um, and so it also, I think as managers, we need to encourage that they take those benefits because we can design those well-being policies, but then if men don't take it, it's hard. And again, going back to the pandemic, um, it's, you know, you can probably after a while tell when a woman is pregnant, hopefully, um, but not so much with men and some men are very private. So as a manager of, a, you know, a team majority of men, five of them came and said, I'm going to paternity. And I wasn't prepared for that. So I had to stop for a second in my, in my house and talk to my husband and said, 
what should I do about this? Because I wasn't prepared and I need this man in the office. But on the other hand, I want them to take it because it's a good example. So we struggle with implementing this also as leaders and as women, because we know it's good for us. But I remember saying, oh my God, I wish 15 years ago, you know, these policies were not there. I wouldn't be having a staffing issues. So to your point of, it starts with us, it, it's really hard, um, you know, we, we design policies and then we have to implement them and, and live by these rules and make sure we make time to plan and make them work. I think that this men bonded with their kids and they came back being much more thoughtful leaders. Uh, and, and it was certainly worth it, but at the time it felt like a mini crisis, you know, we need to solve. Do you know what? We can learn so much from our colleagues in Scandinavia and in Europe, you know, so we talk about three months, six months, nine months maternity leave. People get a year's leave both partners you know men are encouraged to participate in the child care and that's where the education starts at a very early age so to you know we are still so far away from where we need to be but having those policies in place is a really really good place to start and us as leaders again you know taking that on and really working with our people to bring that forward and really educating ourselves and our people in terms of you know it's important for you to take time off spend time with your family that's what really matters I agree. And I want to follow with you, Zultana, because you had such good ideas. And I have here in my question, I have double responsibility, right? Not just as co-founder of Chief, which is an amazing women network, but also, you know, client engagement at SAP. But you also mentioned you're running DNI at SAP. So I think you have like many responsibilities. And you also transitioned to Miami. You mentioned your intro in the midst of the pandemic. So you've you probably can share a holistic view about what are the barriers to implement some of these policies. We just mentioned one, right? Which is like, you know, designing these policies and then implementing them. And you have some good examples in the North of Europe, but what are other barriers you've seen and what advice can you give to all of us? And that's a great question. And I actually was thinking about it this morning on the way in. Um, and you, thank you for mentioning all of that. My, yeah, I, I keep busy a little bit. Um, I don't know if you, if anyone has heard of Chief. It's uh, it's a new organization. I, I see some nodding heads. It's an amazing organization. I joined, so it's it's a it's a women's networking organization for senior leaders to get women to those senior positions and keep them there. And it's a growing body. It's been around for about three three and a half years. Um, we just had our first uh, Miami meeting two days ago. So I saw all of my Chief sisters uh, for the first time ever, and it's it it was absolutely incredible. But one of the things we talk about is, of course, these topics. And it's, you know, these are, it's a great opportunity to have that open discussion around what really matters and what are some of the barriers and what responsibilities we have to ensure that those, you know, that, that we start having that conversation. So I think some of the barriers that, that we were talking on, we literally had that conversation, exactly the same one, is the short, short term focus on profitability, on productivity, on driving the bottom line. That's, you know, or we can kid ourselves all we want, but the reality is companies and organizations exist to be profitable, right? And you know, the, the shift that we need to start having is that if you want the organization to be profitable, you need to start focusing on people. It's not customers, it's not the product, it's, not, it's the people that drive success. And I think once companies start thinking about who and what drives success, that shift starts to happen. Now, how do we do this? So being in chief and having that conversation and being that multiplier, taking those ideas back to my organization, speaking at conferences, and actually being the change agent, working with the government, working with the policy makers, working with the policy makers within your company as well, is really, really important. And that's where the change has to start. We have to start bringing awareness. There is no other way about this. I mean, profitability, um, focus on the bottom line are all really, really important, of course, and nobody wants to take away from that. But, you know, given that women represent a significant number of people in the workforce, why not start focusing on these conversations on how do we support the women? Why not start overcoming these barriers? So Chief and all of the, you know, I'm going to address this to the, to the ladies because it's, it's a women's organization. I'm really happy to answer any questions you have, um, tell you a little bit more about what the organization does, some of the wonderful things that we focus on, how we support each other. I mean, mental well-being, physical well-being are one of the top things that we talk about. 
um, and how we drive policy change as well uh, within the United States. We're hoping to go global over the next couple of years, so getting really, really excited to learn from our colleagues um, in other countries. But, uh, but yeah, really happy to share whatever, you know, any questions you have and tell you a little bit more about it. I don't want to push it too much here, but, uh, but it's a really great organization and I'm hoping to see that, uh, you know, we have start, we start having special interest groups um, lobbying for women's interest and for women's issues as well in the next couple of years. And one follow up question on that, and not to dig deep into chief, but the fact that you have a group of senior leaders discussing these topics is super insightful, right? And, and if we can all benefit from some of the conclusions there, um, you also have coaching sessions there, right? And, and a lot of topics come up that then inform the decisions of how we design well being policies back in our offices. Where is the conversation going? What's, what's next? Because we've seen a very um, quick um, progress because of the pandemic and some flexibility. Some of you are here, some of you are uh, able to take some off, but where, what do you see in the future? So the, this is where the conversation is going. There is a very, very strong focus on mental health. I think we've got, first of all, I mean, Chief is a great opportunity to get to know everyone and get to know where people, you know, what people are thinking. We've got a lot of um, people coming in to talk to us. So Michelle Obama was with us a few weeks ago. Um, we had the founder of Bonobos, I think it's, you say Bonobos, talking about mental health and how he coped with having a nervous breakdown and having some mental health issues. So bringing these conversations to the people and, you know, making sure that they're accessible. Menopause for sure is one of the topics we talk about. Of course, it's all women mm -hmm. of a certain age being in leadership. This is, you know, it opens it up and it makes the conversation easier. I mean, it was a complete taboo subject a few years ago. You didn't talk about that. You can talk about testicular cancer. You couldn't talk about menopause. What is this? So it's, it's desensitizing all of us to be able to have these conversations. But where are we headed with this? We're headed to um, ensuring women are represented in the workplace. That is the number one thing that the chief is concerned about. And the benefit that that brings, not just to the women, but to the society as a whole, to the organization, and actually to the bottom line. Mental health, physical health are all big topics, and being able to share those topics is also absolutely key. We will continue building our organization. I think we're 15,000 members now in the United States. We're going to continue driving these conversations um, with panels such as this one, internally with our organizations, and actually start to make policy changes um, wherever possible. So. That's where we're taking it. But the focus for sure is driven by the, you know, how do we ensure that women are powerful and mental health, physical health are absolutely at the forefront. I just wanted to add a follow on comment to, to what, what you were saying, you know, thinking about the profitability piece. Um, one of our big mantras, and I think this came from Jim Collins. I don't know if anyone else is big Jim Collins fans, but I've read all of his books. And he has this idea around the power of the ant. And our, our CEO talks a lot about that. And the whole idea is that none of this stuff is mutually exclusive. You can be profitable and look after your employees and look after your clients and look after your communities. And actually, if you do all of those things, you will be much more successful. As we started this, and I, I shared, you know, at the end of the day, our companies are really about our people. Yes, we've got products and services, but at the end of the day, if you don't have great people who are thriving and feel good about where they are on their journeys in their life, you know, you don't have a company. So, and then the same thing with your communities, you know, the, these are the communities that we live and work in and, and, and sell our services. If they're not doing well. So I, I love that concept. I don't know. I, I heard it several years ago and it just, it really resonated with me, the whole idea of the power of the end. Um, so. No, I'm glad you made that comment because I don't know if you heard, but she leads a 7,000 people team for a while that I don't even know if that's a team that's like a village <laughs> and in yeah and in that I'm sure you have like you know different generations uh genders um really cultures so I, I was wondering what are the different trends you've seen and the needs from that large group and how do you manage 
yeah, it's, um, I, I surround myself with really great people, <laughs> which is something we always have to remind ourselves as leaders is we can't do it all ourselves. So it's really important to build a very good, strong, diverse bench underneath you. And yeah, I mean, I've got, I've got teams in, in Asia, in, in Europe, in LATAM, you know, in the US and um, what they've been going through, what their needs are, are very different. And a lot of it is cultural. So as we think about women and, and, and some of the challenges challenges that they've been through. And again, I'm generalizing and generalizing is always a little bit dangerous. But if I think about um, in India, I've got a lot of people in India, and you think about some of the stresses and the pressures that are on them. In many of these countries, the women still carry the, the most of the burden when it comes to all the responsibilities outside of the office, um, caring for elder parents, caring for their children, the home and everything. And also in many sometimes are the breadwinners. And so we saw that really as a problem during COVID, in particular, you know, India, where you've got multi-generations living together in the same home and the woman trying to work from home and just the stresses around that. So a lot of programs we had to roll out in terms of elder care. A lot of places here, people really focused on child care, which is really important. But in a lot of the other countries, it was the elder care programs that were really important. You know, in Asia, and again, I'm being making generalizations, is that, um, you know, we talk about how important it is here for women to talk and speak out. But in a lot of those countries, they just don't they don't really have a voice and it's just a cultural thing they don't they don't talk um you know and share their opinions so trying to pull that out of them really trying to understand and be you know train our leaders and our managers to be you know have more direct conversations not just about their performance but how are you doing how is everything going are you you know happy what what do you need so um and get them comfortable having those conversations so we definitely see a difference and so in terms of how we design our benefits they are um based on country and and region and it is based on the feedback we get from our employees in terms of what they want um there are some that are just table stakes around insurance and things like that and 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 leave but there are a lot that are uniquely tailored to those specific countries in terms of what those individuals need yeah. You were mentioning that and a thought came to my mind on a conversation with some of my uh, VPs in my team. That responsibility that sometimes women take outside the office, sometimes we also take it inside the office. Like who organized the drinks? Who prints the memos before the committees? Who uh, manages the inter-program? Who don't, you know, gives more hours to mentorship? who organize the women networks and the Hispanic networks. I mean, it's all women. So I think we also take a lot of that on our shoulders inside the office. And there's a little bit of a bias there. I myself prefer sometimes to go to women because they're more reliable for those things. And so asking for help and delegating those also to men as allies is also important because I think we take so much more also inside the office, which affects our well-being and mental health. We see so much <laughs> that extra hour we could be at home. Yeah, and I think it's also, we talk about generational as well. And I think that's changing. And that's what gives me, you know, um, uh, hope <laughs> for sure. And, and, and I, I'll share this because I, I, so I grew up in, in the US, you know, at a time, and I don't know if people remember this brand, it was Prince Matchabelli, and they had perfume and they had this commercial. And it was, you know, I can bring home the bacon, fry it up in a pan, and never, never let you forget you're a man. And it's like, that's what I heard. Okay, that's it. That's the perfect one. I'm going to go out. I'm going to get a job. But man, I'm going to come home and I'm going to be the perfect house, you know, maker. But man, I'm never going to let my husband forget he's a man. I'm going to look beautiful, you know, and it's like all these pressures we put on ourselves. It's like, I have to do all that because that's what the perfect woman does. Thank God that's not <laughs> that commercial uh, is long gone. Um, but part of it is that's this culture that we were brought up on and what we expected. So I, I'm, I'm much more encouraged for what our our young women are being taught today. I'm so glad we can laugh about that now. Yeah. <laughs> but that was such an artifact. I mean, I remember that. I remember watching this and thinking, oh my God, this woman is insane. <laughs> I was like, I want to take that frying pan and hit her over the head. I mean, like, Why are you putting so much pressure on yourself? <laughs> Let's switch gears for a second, Jennifer. And 
the, clearly, you know, this is all impacting our organization and we're doing the best we can to advance it forward. But how is it affecting the way you relate with your clients and external shareholders? Oh, it's it's changed a lot. It's changed a lot in the, in the last couple of years. I would say it changed before COVID, but it accelerated um, since COVID. The conversations that we're having, that talking about these things, it's not just about our, our, our customer, you know, provider relationship or our vendor relationship. It's like, how are you guys dealing with these issues? <laughs> how are you dealing with these problems? We're kind of facing this with, you know, our teams. What, what are you doing? And so um, we're doing a lot more collaboration. So I, I talk about some of our women's networks and we'll do panels like this where we'll actually have clients that will come or vendors and others and, and um, or other competitors even. Really, I see a lot more collaboration, a lot more sharing of information um, to try to get to, you know, what can we do together and, and we know we don't have all the answers. So it's just something that wasn't part of our dialogue so much before, and, and it's very much part of it now. Yeah. I agree. And now with, you know, many of these metrics, you know, to the point of measuring them are also, at least in our firm at Goldman Sachs, a requirement from our, you know, suppliers and yeah. clients. Yeah. They want to know representation and how we're dealing with all these things in order to hire us. And well, and it's required, and we do the same thing for any vendor that wants to do business with us. I mean, we look at their DNA <coughs> metrics. It's it's part of it. Um, so it's 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 a you know to the point of the hiring part. You know, it's part of who you hire, but it's who you're going to do business with. You want to make sure that they um, hold the same values as you do. Alvaro, uh, let's go back to the Ageo. And you guys have a huge portfolio of companies and a multidimensional approach to diversity and inclusion. I want to go back to you know senior leaders and um, why it's important that you know you promote well-being and uh, and how the implementation and the responsibility of CEO plays a role when making this policy successful. Yeah, I think uh, to just touching some points that have been discussed here as well. So the expectation from especially when you are a public trading company like the Agis, the expectations of investors around the role of a CEO has changed a lot. Because in the past, it used to be very financially oriented. And now the non-financial part of the agenda is becoming such a much, it's huge relevance, yeah? Which is the ESG, the sustainability agenda. Um, in the Agile, we call that uh, a spirit of progress in which we made some commitments with investors by 2030 to deliver in many aspects, yeah? in which inclusion and diversity is one of them. Yeah, um, positive drinking is other, water and uh, carbon as many companies around the world. So, but, but I'm just bringing this topic because in the past <laughs> was a nice to have. Now, all this, especially this non-financial aspect of, uh, of, the, of the equation of a value of organization is, become, is more important than ever. And I think in that, the responsibility of the CEO has changed because um, I'm spending today more time developing that muscle, the non-financial one, because the other one is, is well ingrained in the organization already. Um, um, and in the Agile, we have very strong KPIs. For example, our board, the board representation, women board representation is to be about 50%. Today we are 60. So we were the first company in the world that achieved a board representation like that three years ago. Um, the, local, the female representation in the organization it needs to be about 50% as well. But the most important one is around leaders, women, you know, uh, female presentation leadership positions, which needs to be 50%. Today, the agile globally, we are not there. But in Latin America, we are at 65%. When you look at 60, the, the, the directors and senior directors in Latin America represent more than 65% of the organization. So we are really making progress in interaction. So there are a lot of solid KPIs. It's not becoming, it's not a, a, a fluffy conversation anymore. It's a hard conversation with the same relevance and impact that the financial one. And I think the other, the other aspect is that goes beyond. For example, we, if our marketing ads and commercial campaigns needs to be a diverse voice, it used to be very male oriented. Now they are even measuring, you know, how many females and, uh, and different ethnicities in how we are, you know, um, put in front of our commercial ads. And then and maybe the last point is around the, as we are more demanding around our suppliers and who we are working for and even our customers. So I was in Chile, in Santiago de Chile four weeks ago <clears throat> and we have a general manager, a female general manager in the market. And I was with her in, in, in a conversation with the board of one of the most in, the biggest, uh, the largest retail companies in Chile. 
all men, not all men and all white, yeah? Not a single one, a single leader there. And one of the, the way how we finish the conversation is that they don't change that in two years, we will stop doing business with them. So I think uh, it's, it's how we start to be much more demanding also in how we are shaping the external environment. This is the main responsibility that I see that I have right now as a CEO. I love that you brought an example from the region because certainly we've been talking about Europe and the States, but, and, and obviously in Bank of America, very global <laughs> footprint with your team, Jennifer, but certainly I lead the Latin American team and talking to governments and corporates and financial institutions across Latin America is quite challenging, right? I mean, um, some of the themes are still very new and, uh, you know, the metrics are not there. And uh, I think there is, you know, there is some process that would require for them to, to catch up, like many other things. Um, and so I, I was wondering how you're replicating this approach, you know, globally at Vigeo and uh, Diageo, and how are you preparing managers and senior leaders to implement some of these policies and really be ambassadors, believe that this is helpful to the organization and that is going to lead to very positive results? Yeah. So I think it's through a lot of the programs that we have been discussing. Look, at Diageo, this is very you know, in the DNA of who we are. So it's not about, it's something that you feel that you need to force it. This is really since the CEO, this since the chairman, the CEO, it's, it's, a, it's a true belief around this is the right thing to do, not only in a, in a dreaming way, also in a, from a business perspective. Yeah, we have that our organization reflect our consumer base. And our consumer base is completely diverse. Yeah, and I think uh, if you really want to understand the consumer, you need to have the organization as a mirror of that. Um, and I think how we are preparing the organization, one of the biggest challenges that we are seeing for the next five years um, is during the pandemic, a lot of you know, the, a lot, yes, a lot of female left the workforce. And what were things that we are seeing in many markets is that they are not coming back. So there are going to be, and every single organization, especially public trading companies, and under the same pressure about diversity. So there are going to be a war for talent, especially female talent coming, you know, in, and it's happening right now. And I think that will force even more sense on sort of urgency. And these topics about flex, you know, um, flex styles, about well-being, about the right culture, et cetera, because in order to attract um, that talent. Is gonna is is gonna require something different that we were at today, and that's happening right now. Marcela, um, Atlas Renewable Energy's case is truly exceptional. I mean, it's a young company which is a foundation has made well-being at the center of the discussion and a priority in the business agenda. Can you share the reason behind this approach? How it translates into action? And what has been an out, the outcome when building a resilient and loyal workforce? I probably should have said that at the beginning, but Atlas <laughs> Renewable Energy, it's a renewable energy company. We operate in different countries. And like you said, Agostina, it's a relatively new company. And I had the fortune of joining the company. I always say this, but I'm the first employee of Atlas that doesn't come from the previous company that created uh, the company that we have right now. Um, and I had the fortune of, of doing that, and I'm, I'm super happy of being at that point in time, not only on my career, but I, I would say that also for the industry, because it was creating a company from scratch, so I had the opportunity to actually put in place everything that I believed in, and having the support of a really great leadership team like uh, we have with a CEO that completely buys in everything that I say, and I, he, he and all the rest of, of my colleagues at the leadership team also uh, believe in this. Um, so, so it has been a, a fantastic journey, and at first I would say that sometimes we, we were a bit of a little bit naive on some of the things that we wanted to implement and to follow up with. So for example, when setting up the company and discussing about the benefits, is what happened to you, Jennifer. It's like, okay, so we will have the same benefits for everybody in, in, all, the, um, in, all, in all of our regions. And the idea was exactly to, for people not to feel that they are second-class citizens. So no matter where they worked in Atlas, they, everybody had the same benefits. 
because we truly believe that, that <laughs> everybody is the same and should have the same opportunities and access to the same benefits, especially if you wanted to create a well-being and a, and a wellness um, <coughs> conscious around the company. And it was based in our culture. And then you, fa you, you face the day-to-day -day problems, like what happened to you. It's like not all the regions are exactly the same. And it's not from, from um, an organizational perspective that you start finding stoppers. It's many times from uh, governments and, and from the local regulations where, for example, in our health insurance or our health benefit, uh, we always say that the health insurance is for you and your significant other. But in some of the countries where we have operations, for example, having a domestic partner, it's not legally recognized. So that also poses you with, a, with a, a, a difficulty in terms of what are you going to do as a company? Because what you truly believe is that it doesn't matter your legal status, you should, your significant other should be covered by the health insurance. And um, so it's, it's, a, a, it's, it's a lot of uh, struggles and crossroads that you face when building and creating a company and what your culture, what your values and what you believe in is going to be. Uh, it's not all, always uh, making sure that you walk the talk, but also you have to make compromises in terms of financial, uh, for example, uh, financial decisions that you need to take, profitability decisions that you need to take. You're going to have a more expensive health insurance, for example, but what are you truly working for? But like also what Jennifer said, it's not a decision that you need to make. It's it's not an or, it's an and. So you can actually have and make a, a good work environment for everybody and at the same time being a profitable company and at the same time making sure that your people have a great experience working for you. And I would say the outcome is that, yes, we have grown a lot in these five years, not only from a business perspective, also from a, from a, from a people perspective. One of the other things that I think we are truly proud of is that when we first began at Atlas, there was 11% of women. We were 20 people. So basically it was the lawyer and me. <laughs> also women in traditionally female occupied positions. And so it said, I said, no, 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 this, <laughs> this is not good. We need to change this. And that is why we implemented, for example, the recruiting policies that I was mentioning before. And not just about asking headhunters to bring more women. It's like having blind CVs, for example, so that you don't know what you're interviewing until you face with the person and, oh, great, you're a man, you're a woman, you're, it's your color, your race, you're, it's, it's, uh, it has been a great journey. So in terms of gender specifically, yes, we have grown from 11% to 40% of women. And, and it's been, uh, again, it's, uh, it's, it's been tough because there's a lot going on, like I said at the beginning. It's a multifactorial thing, I would say, not just recruiting, also making sure you have the right work conditions and that you make women also advance in the organization. Just for those of you that missed it at the beginning when she introduced herself, her role is Chief People and Communications Officer, which is a very interesting role for a you know, young organization just to make it you know, a center of the discussion. So one of the follow-up questions I had is really if you can share that journey of designing, I mean, defining that role and, and where are you taking this role forward? Like I said, it was there was nothing at first, so it was a really broad job description. <laughs> and part of the job description was trying to put a name to my position. <laughs> and at first I was HR, and then I, it wasn't HR, then it was uh, management people, and there was a lot of things. And then I said, no, no, this is people. <laughs> people and communications, because communications, it's what at the end of the day, for example, in my case, I think brings our culture alive. So it's really important that everything that we do from a communication perspective is also aligned who, on uh, what we believe in terms of value and, and in culture. So the journey has been a blast. And, and like I said, also being a psychologist and having the opportunity to be creative in a company that's sort of a startup in a way, not now, because we already have really long Pants, but um, uh, uh, being uh, working with people who have that mentality that they are not afraid of trying new things uh, and also of being wrong and going back and saying I'm wrong and and, be, and also having the opportunity of working with people who say maybe I believe this in the past maybe I thought that women I don't know only could do certain kind of things and now changing the way that people think I think for me it's been uh, not only a professional but personal experience that I, I'm, I'm truly grateful for. This is really great. And before we close and hopefully take a few q and I'm sure you guys have tons of questions. I'm not sure if we're going to have a lot of time, but maybe a few just to open it up before networking session, and then you can follow up one-on-one -on -one with each of them. Um, I wanted to take your thoughts on what's next. And, you know, we've, we've all agreed 
that this is a very complex issue and keeps evolving and needs from our, you know, from our teams and our people and our companies keep evolving. But I would love to hear what are your thoughts in terms of what's coming next and what needs uh, and issues require very innovative solutions. I can continue with the inspiration. <laughs> um, I think that for from my perspective, one of the main challenges in everything is not just opening doors for women and for diverse group. It's always also keeping the doors open, I would say. And so the main challenge is how to make this grow. So in my specific case of colors is maintaining now that the company has a different dimension and that we are in a different stage on, on our existence as a company is how do we keep what we believe in and what moves us like coherent with who we are and walking the talk. And like I said, it's not just opening doors, creating new things. It's easy to put something new when there is nothing. The difficult thing is to manage things when they have already grown up. And like, like you were mentioning, it's about managing and, and, and understanding what you're doing and, and continue growing from there. So <laughs> the challenge is that it's the different scale and maintaining that. Yeah, I, I would say, you know, as, as we continue to evolve, it's, it's taking a different approach in terms of how we set our policies, what we what we focus on. I mean, we've always done employee, you know, surveys and questionnaires, but, you know, talking about, you know, this period of, of massive change that we're going through a lot of it, you know, um, you know, compelled by the, the pandemic is, you know, the, the whole idea of flexibility. You know, and so, you know, we did this huge questionnaire, like we always do, send it out. What does it mean to you? What do you want? We got it back. And oh my God, you know, the variety. And like you say, because it was global. I mean, we had, you know, we had over 150,000 people replied to this. You know, how do you make sense of that and put a policy in place? And so then all of a sudden we started parsing it out and say, we, we got to dig down more now. We've got to do, we got to split this all up. We've got to give it to the different groups. We have to now do further listening groups. So, you know, we're doing those and having, and we're bringing in professionals to come in because the whole idea is to have something that's sustainable you know we don't want to throw something out there that just it seems like it's being responsive in the moment but then you realize it doesn't work and then you have to take it back and then that's even a worse experience so i just think the how we have our conversations with our employees is changing and and it can't be just a once a year one and done we throw out a survey and then we do something off the back of it is 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 being reactive in the moment and being thoughtful and and thinking of the different ways a lot of these smaller group sessions and and collecting the feedback and then drilling down and really asking the questions so that you really understand what they need so um yeah and making sure it's not just a you know a fad in the moment but that it's something that's sustainable and that's a change i think for us Jennifer completely agree. So one of the things I was thinking about, and I work for a technology company, and when I look at our numbers of women in the workforce or women in leadership position, we are still so far behind. It is incredibly difficult to hire women in technology positions. Um, it's it, That's just a fact. One of the things we started to do is go out to universities and look for young talent and nurture the young talent and work with the young talent and bring that young talent in. And it's underrepresented, it's not just women, it's underrepresented communities, underrepresented talent. So that's one of the things we started to do. But we, the responsibility we have as leaders is raise awareness, continue discussing this, just continue having that open dialogue, bring it to the fore. Don't hide behind, you know, oh, it's not my job, it's not my responsibility. We all own that. It's all of ours, you know, we are the change agents. We are the multipliers, so we have to work with our employees, with our leadership, and go beyond. So organizations such as Chief really foster these discussions, but really drive the change in the policy. I think that's where it needs to go. You know, if it's not, like I keep saying, if it's not measured, if it's not implemented, it's not gonna make any difference. You know, it's, it's great to have better awareness, but un, until it's built in, until it's actually a normal, natural thing to have these discussions and to have that representation of females at senior levels and to have wellness discussions, it's not a thing. We just keep talking about it and lip service is really not enough to get us there. So that's that's kind of, you know, my two cents worth on that. And I, you know, from my personal perspective, I, I pledge to continue having that awareness. And I love the fact that we have a panel here focused on wellness and, and you know, the really key topics that we need to keep having. So my enormous thanks to the organizers for actually taking the time to organize a panel such as this.
Yeah, um, for, for my perspective, I think one of one of the or what is coming is one of the, the the potential risks that we are running is assuming that we are getting back to some level of normality. Yeah. And what is happening is that is this continuous sense of endless crisis because it was COVID, then the Ukraine Russia situation, and then global recession coming. And it's like a, when you just see that what's coming, it's even more important to double down on well being because we cannot assume that, you know, that's gone. It's uh, what the, the organization, all of us as individuals, are going to require from a psychology of safety as an environment. And especially in such an unprecedented volatile times, it's just uh, will force us just to continue focusing on that. Um, I think uh, just specifically in Latin America, one of the things for us is now, it's, it's not that gender is not important, but we have made so much progress there. Now it's about the ethnicity, gender, uh, ethnicity diversity is what we are focusing on. And that is even a most profound <laughs> transformation because require, um, really working on education and with governments and regulations, et cetera, to really, you know, change this picture in market like Brazil or Mexico, et cetera. But that's, that's what we are committed to do. Um, and I think that the, on the gender part, the, now we have a very good representation of senior leader, <laughs> female senior leaders. But when you look at the succession pipeline, especially for general managers leaders, it's, it's still very, it's weak. So I think one of the things that we are working right now is around how can we accelerate and make bold bets with people in order to, you know, uh, better prepare that pipeline for the future. I want to say thank you very much, and uh, and that you take, you know, you apply some of these things you've been talking to yourselves. I mean, especially what what Tana was saying about taking time off because you are powerful leaders. You are impacting today and for the foreseeable future so many other people's lives and your communities and your families and taking time off to just discuss this and you know help us all reflect about the things and bring them home uh, it's so powerful so thank you very much and uh do we have time for a few questions we have time we can take maybe two yes two or three we have a thank <laughs> you I, oh. Hello. Um, hi, Sarah Salcedo from MasterCard. I manage privacy and data protection for Latin America. So I just want to say I was super skeptical and I love the Women's Hemispheric Network. I've been participating since it was launched originally in New York 10 or more years ago, but I was so skeptical of this topic and I want to be so transparent. I was so skeptical of Marcello, and you, and also Alvaro, and you guys killed it. I am, uh, I'm really moved that you are aware of your privilege, <laughs> that you know how to speak about these things. Um, I hope that you're in some man chief organization where you speak to other leaders, um, because I, I, my cynicism is I'm I'm surprised and I'm delighted. Um, so I actually, if it's okay, had a question and a comment for Marcello. So question, I'll share the comment first. Um, I loved all the programming. I was actually really surprised to see that. I feel like we don't, I don't think I see that in the US. So I was really surprised about the programming. And I guess one feedback because I hope given everything you talked about that you will accept or consider the feedback is just one thing, but I don't think it's minor. And I'm saying it as uh, trying to be an ally to the black community. I would take a look at that comment, that intro about, and from the hood, so-and-so in the Belessas. Just, I think that in the spirit of being allies, I think that's a one that I'd wanna would bring up. Otherwise I was really amazed. And then secondly, you said a lot, you know, that people are like, here he comes again. I feel like that's who I am as well. So I feel you, but you said, um, you repeated a few times that you have this perspective because of your education. And I was just wondering what you meant by that. Something about maybe how you were brought up or I was just curious about, about what that, what you meant by that, what what that was, and I'd want to know that so that 
I bring up my future son in that way, or I speak in that way. So I was just curious about that. Yeah, I, I believe that, uh, again, like I said, I came from a matriarchal family, uh, <laughs> you know, my grandmother, my mom, uh, I think my father educated us to have a lot of respect, you know, within the family and, uh, and everyone, right? So uh, I was raised with that. Um, and uh, I, I think I had a, I can call it like a, a blessing raising with a family that was very loving. And I ended up marrying to a woman that is fantastic. I mean, she's like a <laughs> hundred million times more intelligent than I am. She's a Brazilian chess champion, you know, and, and so I, I had a great female role models, but I had also um, male role models in terms of uh, respecting, you know, uh, respecting the woman, you know, I think that was a key for my uh, education. I have two other brothers and one young sister, and I think we are all the same, you know, so I think that was, it starts at home, you know, I'm part of the the diversity and equity uh, group of my kids' school, you know, so I'm the only father, you know, all the other are, are mothers. And uh, I always tell, you know, in this group that uh, it has to start at school. It has to start when we are kids. I mean, because when you, you learn about respect, you learn about how you see, you know, uh, the girls and how you, you have to understand, you know, the differences, but also that we, we all the same, you know, you kind of raised to be a better human being. I think that, that's, that's what happened, you know, so I was really blessed to have the family I had. And thank you so much for, you know, uh, your recommendation or feedback. I'll make sure that I, <laughs> I'll change that in speech. Thank you so much. Thank Appreciate you. that. Maybe just one more quickly. Anybody has one? If not, Sorry. Go ahead. Okay. Hi. Um, my name is Emma Pissetti. I'm a senior vice president at City National Bank. First, I want to say thank you. This was the most refreshing conversation I've heard around this topic, and I was really impressed. Um, I was recently asked to be in our women in leadership um, group in our organization, and one of the topics that I thought was important is how men can advocate for women. Um, a lot of times women are leading these conversations, and we all, I think, feel the same and so we understand each other um, but the importance of having senior level um, managers who are men um, support women and I think um, Marcelo you mentioned uh, your mentor to women um, you mentioned you know advocating for a woman in a meeting um, you know and pressing a company to you know step forward and so how um, can we as women my question is to both Marcelo um, and Alvaro um, how can we as women create opportunities uh, for our male colleagues to kind of step into those roles uh, when maybe it's not something that become, that's a natural priority, not because they don't want to, but perhaps because they're just not something that they're prioritizing? Yeah, um, thank you. Thank you so, so much for your comments as well. Um, look, I think the, fil the first thing that comes to my mind is around when I talk about psychological safety, it's creating environments in that you have the freedom to demand that. Because it's not asking a favor to a male leader to play that role. It's our role to play. So I think, uh, I think it's a step in. And again, when you are seeing someone in at the leadership population that you have in front of you, it's just having that space to feel that you have the voice to be more demanding on that aspect. And I think uh, the other part is around when someone, and the other thing that I've seen is sometimes we as male leaders, we get clumsy when we approach these topics. So we are learning our, our own way, but then it's with the best intention behind. So when someone is getting into conversations like menopause, et cetera, that are quite uncomfortable you know, for us to have, the fact that you can acknowledge that and recognize the effort, even if it wasn't perfect, I think that will create more confidence, you know, um, in us as leaders, as male leaders, to, to feel more free to navigate something with, because we are rewiring decades of behaviors. Um, and I think that's the most important thing for all of us to just to understand. Yeah, I, I agree with Alvaro. It's like, I was so nervous here today to start speaking. I was like, oh God, they put me first to speak here. I was sweating. I was like, oh my God, you know, I'm so nervous. It's like, uh, I think the first thing ever, you know, that uh, 
I do is to listen. You know, I think it's very important to listen. Uh, I don't have so many people reporting to me like you have. You know, I have about a hundred people. So every year, I I have one one with every single one on my team. So at least thirty minutes, uh, I dedicate to to listen to people. And um, for my male leaders, you know, uh, is always to change the narrative. Right? Is to is to question, is to uh, make sure that they understand that uh, that's natural, is there's nothing wrong about it, you know, to uh, to open the way and, and, and to get a platform. And um, there are two things that I'm always very careful. And when I speak to my, uh, uh, the, the men that work with my team is, uh, first of all, it's, it's, you know, not come up as discrimination, right? It is like, oh, I, we need to give more, you know, the platform for women, we need to hire more women, but also, you know, understanding about, you know, uh, how someone is prepared for the job. Uh, and second one, I'm always very careful not to take the platform as my own. It's not my platform. You know, I'm here to help, you know, I'm here to uh, uh, open the conversation to make sure that, I, you know, I give the microphone to do who has the right to have the microphone, you know, and uh, when I do that, you know, I serve as a role model for all other, you know, colleagues I have, you know, so it's, it's, it's it, and it's, again, it's like I said, it's resilience, it's to make sure that, oh, here he comes again, and I, I really do that, you know, and uh, um, our boss, which is a great guy, you know, he, he came to me and said, Marcello, you know, it's so good because I'm learning how to speak with women. I, I, I didn't know how to do that because it's like, you know, and he's very honest about it because it's not about also, you know, it's, it's making people realize because they're, they're, they don't realize, you know, my, my older brothers, they don't realize, you know, and then we, we start to question, you know, it's not like they're against anyone. It's just like, they didn't think about it. They didn't think they are supposed to talk about it. They're not supposed to get involved. You know, because again, a women's network, so I'm, I'm not part of this, you know, so yeah, you are, you know, so when you do that and you do natural, you know, it's, it's, it's and it becomes part of the, the narrative, you know, you make the change. And then we see that happening a lot with our team because of these four years, we dedicate a lot of effort and time to make the change real and not just the speech, not just the, the shows. I mean, the shows is great because it's the tip of the iceberg that uh, we're reaching out audiences everywhere but it's what is below that you know how the women work in those shows everything everyone that is involved you know Sally's team on the legal side you know so it's like uh, that's the way you're going to invite men to really understand what an amazing opportunity we have not to shine but uh, to be <laughs> on the backstage but uh, making sure that when you see your your female leaders shiny it's, it's it's great for everyone it's, it's really good and diversity really makes a change you know it, it really brings the, the business to advance the business it's not about the finance or impact only it's about people right so i hope i have asked uh, you know you know answer your question can i complement one thing exactly what you were saying i think that mentoring is also a two a two-way street yeah. so it's it's not you approaching necessarily because yeah there's a lot that we need to learn but take also the opportunity to like martello said mentor the uh, the counterpart or, and and then have them as allies so that you can amplify your voice this has been outstanding oh i, I know we have so many more questions but agustina jennifer marcela Svetlana, alvaro um we have been putting together uh, our women's hemisphere network for six years i know agustina does quite a bit in new york in argentina brazil chile colombia throughout the americas and i can tell you this has been one of the most fantastic panel so thank you i hope we can have each one of you back for a one-on-one -on -one conversation the wealth of knowledge and also just the experience that you've shared is extremely valuable because i think everybody here is taking back something that they can implement and that's what it's a lot all about so thank you so much you will be back because we will haunt you <laughs> to make sure so uh now